Hello and welcome back to Rev Endurance Sports and another event recap. First thing I wish to apologize for is on a previous video event recap. I so uh, Jess and I have these new mics and I was not aware that you could actually adjust the input volume on these microphones. Uh, the, the previous microphones we had, you know, it was one setting. You turned them on and then you went, uh, you went live. Uh, secondly, I made a video where it may sound like I was sandbagging and then I had a really good day on the bike. So um, it just happens that way sometimes. And third, the premise of these videos is pretty much so that you can learn either from my mistakes or my successes and uh, maybe you can apply some of the things I did on my, my um, event, my ride. And you could say, oh, I like that. I won't do that, but I do like this. And oh, those tires and, and something. I hope that you glean something from it. And so please, when that comes up and you're like, oh, great. Please make a comment down below. Contribute to the conversation positively and uh, we can all learn as a community from my successes and my failures, if you will. Okay, so let's get, uh, let's get into this. So this is a recap for a 300 kilometer brevet here in the San Diego area. Um, I like to do local events. I mean, the thing about brevets is they're inexpensive. You know, for us, our local chapter is like $30 for a 300K, much cheaper than a double century. Also, I'm not um, removed from my home, so I can stay at, at home, no lodging, no gas for travel and all that stuff. So I like doing brevets because of that. So this one started, I don't know, 15 miles or so from my home, so that was great. Started in Solana Beach and did a... Um, counterclockwise rotation. Okay, so let's start with the weather. SoCal weather typically is really nice in April, May time frame, but we've had a little bit of, of a cooling trend just recently. So it was 46 at the start. And as we kind of went inland, it was, um, it got lower temperature. Um, just before the first control, it was like 40 degrees. So you know, for us, we, uh, I am a delicate flower and I just don't like to ride in really cold weather anymore. I just don't feel that I need to do that anymore. Um, so I made some notes and I'll be referring to them as we go along. Um, clothing. So because it was 46 and I kind of saw that the inland temperatures were going to get a little colder, but being a long day on the bike, um, I knew that at some point it would start to warm up as well. Uh, so let me, let me, I should have done this already, but the, the headline is we finished in 11 hours and 20 something minutes total time, 1244 rolling time. So if you do that math, 16 plus 20, that's 36 minutes of stop time. That includes the controls, stoplights, and all that other stuff, right? So I like to keep my stop time to a minimum. And that's really the only way I can get these events done uh, quickly anymore because, well, I'm just not a fast rider. So what I need to do is minimize my stop time, which you never get back. Uh, and, and so Brooke and I rode uh, really well together. I think he was holding back for me, but uh, but we were able to, to partner up and, and ride really well together, two up all day, just trading poles, and we finished in 11.20. So that, that's a really good time for me uh, on a 300K. All right, anyway, let's get into this, the rest of this. So um, because the weather was going to change about 25 degrees Fahrenheit, so from in the low, low 40s. Like I said, it was 40 when we went through this one area um, to like mid 60s. I figured, okay, 
best material for that is wool, a wool base layer. But these are 100% merino and they are you know, really thin and they're perfect. A lot of times I layer those rather than wearing a, a, a shell or a big jacket. So in this case, I wore a thin wool base layer long sleeve, a thin Pearl Izumi long sleeve jersey as well. You'll see a lot of this stuff in the video that uh, I'm also compiling, um, footage that Jess took. Thank you, Jess. <laughs> um, and then I wore my PVP reflective vest because it was a pre-dawn start of a 5 a.m. start. So we needed to have our reflective uh, clothing stuff on, right? So the bare minimums that they require it for us is some type of vent or sash, uh, I'm sorry, vest or sash and uh, ankle bands. So had those uh, pink socks with my pink ankle bands. So that worked out nicely. Uh, full finger gloves, but then I almost always wear full finger gloves. These were thin Pearl Izumis. I've done a segment on these on um, when we were doing the Rev show where Jess and I would pick a favorite piece of kit and we would kind of pro profile it and talk about its features and benefits. So um, the Pearl Izumi, I think they're called Pro something, I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's on, it's, it's detailed in a segment. And uh, wool sneakers, as I mentioned, the pink uh, socks. Now they were silka, but it's more for the color, not because they're arrow socks. I just like the vibrant color that those pink socks have. Um, and then my pink um, Rev Cycling Custom Lake CX403s, their top end race last shoe. And, and I didn't wear the custom insoles, but I had mentioned prior to that that I, was, I, I needed to mold them before and I just, I just ran out of time between trying to get them molded and then doing another ride, a longer ride, before the actual event. So that just didn't work out. So at some point, we'll get to that. But I wore a pair of insoles that I know work for me, and those are the SQ Lab insoles that I've had for years. I have a very hard plastic arch and it gives you really good support. So those have always worked well for me. Um, I wore my <clears throat> Pearl Izumi bibs with the Levitate chamois, which I think are a fantastic value. I think they're like 225. I mean, they're just a really, really good uh, bib short. And I wore the ones that have a cargo pocket just so I could kind of separate my nutrition in certain ways, right? So I would have maybe empty wrappers in one of the cargo pockets and then maybe in the other cargo pocket I had, you know, half-eaten cliff blocks or something like that. And then, you know, in the back pockets were my full um, unused um, uh, nutrition packets, right? So I wouldn't mix anything up. All right, let's talk about nutrition. The, the goal was a 12 hour uh, time. And I did the math. I said, okay, 12 hours at about 300 calories per hour. That's around 3,600 calories total. So I devised a plan to have that ready uh, so that, oh, sorry, I totally forgot to mention this. Jess was sagging for the event because she um, she just can't get the mileage in right now. And um, she's got a lot of soft tissue damage flare-ups from her uh, bike accident or truck running her off the road, however you want to describe it. And she um, so she volunteered to sag. And so during a brevet, you cannot follow your rider on the course you must only prov you can only provide support at the controls so the controls were mile 23 83 125 and then of course the finish uh, this is miles by the way uh, <clears throat> and so she uh, was at these controls but the night before what i did is i set up uh, six bottles for her 
so that each bottle had 500 calories and the majority of the calories were from my um, energy product and my own nutrition product. And then as supplements or supplementation, not supplements, but supplementation, I had gels and cliff blocks and, and uh, waffles and things like that, right? So it's important to note that when you're doing your ride, or before you do your ride, I should say, plan out how long you think it's going to take, what your intensity is going to be. So duration and intensity are always the two key factors for your body's nutrition needs. If you're going 12 hours at an easy pace, that's less calories necessary than 12 hours at a hard pace. Or you're going to... You're going out for six hours you know that those two components of duration and intensity you have to fact that's how you factor a guesstimate of how many calories you're going to take with you or how many calories you need to consume during the event so i i have it and i'll put a little table hopefully up in my in post production um so i had seven e-gels they're 150 each I had two Gucci's, two blocks of sleeves, four bottles of my product. So that's uh, four times 500. So 2,000 calories came from that. And then I had half a Coke because I shared the other half with Brooke. And that calorie count came out to 3930. Not an exact science, of course, but more than the 3600. So it's better to be overfueled than underfueled. Um, and so if I did the math divided by 12, you know, I'm over 300 calories per hour, which is where I want it to be. My stomach was perfect all day long. And, I, and the biggest contributing factor to that is using my own product. It's, it's a very easy to digest formula while going at hard intensities. Okay, so... The total number was 3930. Let's just call it 3900. But one thing that I, you know, pro tip, if you will, one thing I, I would like to uh, mention that I've been doing is if you noticed, I had the e gels, the Gucci's, the blocks. So all of these are different calorie com- counter, different amount of calories. So for example, let's say a gel is probably 80 grams, uh, an e-gel is 100, I'm sorry, calories, 80 calories, and an e-gel may be 150 calories, and then you have your cliff blocks, the whole sleeve is 200 calories, but it's six individual blocks, and, uh, you know, swigs from your bottle. And why I like having these different items I mean, taste is important too, right? Changing the flavor. But mainly because I make a judgment call based on where I'm at in that hour, where I am on the course as to whether I'm going to take a 150 gel, an 80 gel, a full sleeve of 200, only two blocks, which is 200 divided by six, you know, so that's probably like 33 per block, so 66 for two, or swigs of fluid, uh, which is a concentrated fuel source. Let's let me give you an example. Let's say I'm doing roller after roller after roller. You know, like let's say within an hour's time, I may hit a few of those rollers, and I'm just swigging because we're just going so hard over the rollers. I may not get a full 300 calories in, in that hour, because we're going so hard. And that's pretty much what happened, Ryan, with Brooke. He's such a strong guy. But let's say we, I do a two mile climb. If I know I've been falling behind on my calories, I may take a full sleeve of my, uh, of like a cliff blocks, 200, and then take a good swig of my concentrated 500 calorie bottle. Or if it's just a mile climb and then another mile climb, I may just take the 80 calorie gel and then another 80 calorie gel and kind of space it out a little bit. So having the different 
size uh, calorie packets has been really helpful for me. You decide how you want to do that. All right, but moving on from that, um, let's see. So that was, oh, so I did want to mention that on this particular ride, I did not eat any solid food. So no sandwiches, no pizza, no burritos. You know, a lot of brevet riders, that's what they do on these brevets. The 300 and above typically, 200 not so much. But on a 300K, 400K, people sit down and they eat places. And I just don't do that. I, I like to ride straight through, get home. Um, and then I eat a good, you know, solid meal. So, uh, so all liquid, no solid foods. Um, again, um, over half of my calories came from my own energy product, perfect stomach. Oh, yes. And then in the morning... I had my typical breakfast, which was a bowl of rice with maple syrup, butter, salt, and an over easy egg. And thank you, Jess, for cooking that up just perfect. So that was my breakfast. And I try to have that breakfast about two hours prior to rolling out. So you decide how you want to work that out. All right. Um, let's talk about the route. So 188 miles with 8,400 feet of climbing. So that's what 302 kilometers, 2760 of climbing is what it ended up being, 2760 meters. And I can describe the course uh, based on the controls in three segments. The first um, zero to mile 83 had the most climbing, so it had like almost 6,000 feet in the first 83 miles. Then the most windy section was from 83 to 125 miles. And then at mile 125 to 188 was the flattest portion of the route. All right, <clears throat> bike setup. I rode my road logic. I just think it's a perfect bike for these types of of rides. Um, there is, there was an opportunity for some aero advantages of stuff. Now, I don't put a lot of stock in that just because I just don't ride fast enough, right? I mean, a lot of these studies are done at 40k. Um, Dylan Johnson did one at 35k in the wind tunnel, but majority of us don't ride that fast. So aero bikes, aero wheels, all that stuff, I don't, I just don't know. But I did ride my um, R60, uh, the jet, head jet R60s. So those are 60 millimeters. They are aluminum with the aluminum brake track. And I put some 32 tires on there just because why not? I know certain parts of that course have really, really bad tarmac. Uh, yeah, so 32 5,000 tubeless. Pressure, I rode at 63, and I thought that was perfect for me. I'm a 150-pound rider, 68 kilograms. Most of the course has super silky smooth road, so I could have inflated it more, but there are portions of the course that the road is so tore up um, that I thought, okay, let's go with 63 to give me some comfort. Um, in one of the videos, I think it was the preview video, someone said, oh, if you're worried about flatting, why aren't you riding gator skins? And I'm like, uh, first of all, I haven't been flatting in, in months and months and months, thousands of miles. Um, the video I had just posted was Jess had a bead separation, which we ended up getting the tire under warranty, a new one. And, uh, and she was riding tubed. Bead separation wouldn't have helped her anyway on tubeless, but I think the bead construction is significantly uh, better on a tubeless tire, so that should eliminate those issues. But I just will not ride gator skins, and definitely not a hard shell tire. Um, and what I responded to that gentleman, I believe is a gentleman, I said to him, um, excuse me, <clears throat> I said to him, I will never ride those tires. They are very, very slow tires. And they have no grip. 
and especially in the wet, they have absolutely no grip. Um, the Four Seasons is promoted as a four season tire. I find that tire is super slow. I'm sorry, Reginald, and, and I love your channel and I think you're a wonderful mate, but I just don't like those GP uh, four season tires. I, I just don't like them. When you ride fast enough, you drop down canyons here. I mean, those tires just don't have the grip. But in particular, the gator skin and the hard shells have terrible grip. And life's too short to ride a shitty tire. And I tell people that all the time. So ride a high quality, good grip, fast tire. And then lastly, about the tire conversation. You are not going to find people at the pointy end of these events on those tires. <laughs> I mean, people that are at the pointy end... Um, like Brooke, myself. Brooke was on Schwabi Pro 1s. I was on the Gator Skin, so Schwabi's another high-end German tire manufacturer. And the Pro 1 is, is a top-end tire. And then I was on the 5000s. And, you know, generally speaking, double centuries, these fast brevets, those people are on raced, race rubber. They are not on puncture-resistant uh, tires. We want to get the event done as fast as possible and if we're descending a mountain or whatever i want grip i want grip okay enough about that sq lab saddle uh, the garmin 1040 solar fantastic i mean i was anti-garmin for a long time this is a fantastic battery life um, cycling computer now um we launched out at 5 a.m. Sunrise was a little after 6.30. Give it another hour, maybe, to actually get some sunlight onto the computer. So let's just say about two to two and a half hours on the front end. It was, you know, on a night mode. And I finished an 11-plus hour event. It still had 81% battery life. So just an incredible cycling computer as far as the, the battery life goes. So I need to do a video at some point on my bike fit on the new Ritchie. My gray Ritchie, way before I ever thought about doing PVP last year, the 1200K, I had cut the steer, steerer tube down and my stem was flat because that head tube the head tube on a 55 is a 160, and for years I rode a 140 head tube on all my carbon race bikes. So I said, oh, okay, I can cut the steer tube on this because that's already two centimeters taller than all my other race bikes that I've had for years. 160 head tube, bring the stem down, I don't need any spacers, whatever. And then years later, I started doing brevets on that bike, and then I did PVP. Well, on the last 200K, of PVP last year, I was getting some uh, neck pain and numbness, um, shoulder pain, and I'm like, oh, okay, so when I build my new Ritchie, I'm not going to cut the steer tube. And so that's where I'm at now. The, the steer tube is not cut. It's, it's cut to the three centimeter limit. And uh, so I need to do a video on that bike setup, but that is that. Okay, let's talk about the ride. <laughs> So we left from Solana Beach Amtrak station or train station. And as soon as you, you know, I don't know, 100 yards later, 100 meters later, we're up a hill. And Brooke just takes off this up this thing standing. And I'm like, oh, geez. And I'm like, is that what I'm in for today? Because I, you know, Brooke, as you'll see in another video, he's been doing a lot of 300Ks and 400Ks this year. And this is April, um, April 6th, whatever the, the day of the event was. And I'm like, oh, geez. So finally caught up to him. Luckily, a couple of lights along the way. And I said, dude, I, I can't ride like that. I need a little bit longer warm up. I mean, we're only five minutes into this thing. And uh, he said, oh, okay, okay. But yeah, I need a long warm up too. I'm like, really? Because <laughs> you just took off up that hill. But after that, 
things seem, seem to settle because I said to him, I said, look, if you, you know, we can ride together for a little while. And if you feel the pace is too slow, please go on ahead. Um, and he says, no, no, no. I, when I saw you on the start list, I, um, I'm committed to riding with you today. And I said, okay, good. I'm committed to riding with you too, but you know, we will make a judgment call later. Um, if, if we need to, you know, part. So he said, okay, cool, cool, cool. Well, it turned out that he was, um, he was true to his word. We rode together the entire day. Um, the first probably, you know, 80-ish miles where all that climbing was, I was climbing, I think, better than him. I don't know if he was just holding back, but I was... I was gapping him, and so every now and then I'd have to slow down and see what, what's going on and, you know, ride together. Because the whole point is riding together until you get to mile 83, because from there to 125 is a wind tunnel. I mean, it's... And if you want to go fast at 20 plus miles per hour, then, of course, you know, wind is your biggest enemy. And so, you know, just increasing your speed two to three miles per hour is an enormous amount of, of wattage to, 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 to make that improvement from 20 miles per hour to 23 to 24. Yeah, our first stop, so this was really good because as I've mentioned in so many other videos, the only way for me to get down the course at a reasonable clip is to not stop a lot. And when I do my no-no ride, so six, seven hours of not, no stopping for potty breaks or refueling, people on Strava and places are like, why do you do that? That's just so stupid. It's dangerous for your body. <laughs> anyway, we rode, Brooke and I rode, both of us, the first five plus hours to get to that control at mile 83 without stopping. I mean, I think our stop time was probably five or six minutes for that whole stretch and it mainly just traffic lights we didn't stop for fluids or 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 potty breaks um, when we got to that control at mile 83 corona just had everything laid out for us she had the bottles laid out she had the noxema laid out um, there was a, a bucket that i had gels and blocks and stuff like that that of course i offered to brooke but you know everything was laid out and it was beautiful thank you jess from there, from mile 83 to the coast, on that bike path, tons of people are out. <laughs> All abilities, if you get my drift. And so you're going pretty hard, and then all of a sudden you got to slow down because, you know, somebody is on, you know, 1980s mountain bike, and they're literally going 10 miles per hour. And you, you were just coming, you know, 24, 25 plus. So you have to be careful and you have to be courteous and you have to, you know, I, I've got a bell on my bike and I, I really encourage you to get one. You don't need to be yelling out on your left and any of that other stuff. Just ring the bell or if you can go wide enough around them, go wide enough around them and, and don't even say anything because by the time you say something and maybe you say on your left and they look to their left but the handlebars go with them and they're going right into you so please if that's happened to you <laughs> make a comment down below because it happens if you're not careful so we try to give a wide berth and just um, some folks we just make a judgment call who we're going to say something to and who we're not there's people walking there's people with dogs and little kids on bikes which is incredibly awesome that's where i used to take my son as well to a bike path so just be courteous. Don't be that guy or girl, right? That gives someone else a bad uh, taste of what cyclists are. Yeah, so power meter is totally essential. Now, yesterday shot a really short clip of um, a gentleman named John that came in and uh, he test rode my Richie. And then my... Um, we're, we're talking about bike options, component group options, things like that. And we talked about a power meter. And for him, he's been using a heart rate monitor for a long time. And that's great. The power meter takes it one step up from that. 
and they're getting so inexpensive. There's really no reason why anyone should be riding without a power meter. It keeps you in check to, to keep you, <laughs> to save you from yourself, from doing silly things, um, overexerting in certain sections or on a hill or chasing someone that you shouldn't be chasing. Let them go up the road, you know, and, and you'll regroup or something later, right? So you can, so you can feel great throughout the entire the entirety of your ride, right? Um, so that's enough about power meters. But we got to the 200 kilometer control, uh, which was in Huntington Beach or Newport Beach, sorry. And Jess had everything set up as well, uh, 200K, so 125 miles. And we got there at 734 total time. And I believe we had like 6,200 feet of climbing, something like that. Now, uh, for folks who like to do brevets fast, they have a, um, a, rank, a category of time, um, like an R60 award, R70, R80. And R60 stands for 60% of the allowable time. So for example, on a 200K, you get 13 hours and 30 minutes to to finish it, to be an official finisher. On a 300K, you get 20 hours. So 60% of 20 is 12 hours. And that's why that was my goal, 12 hours. R60 is just a nice thing to shoot for. Unfortunately, R60 is the same across the entire planet. So if you're in Florida and you have no hills and you happen to have a fairly good day as far as favorable winds, it's easy to run off a, a 10 hour um, 300K, right? 20 mile per hour average speed, boom, easy enough. If you're on, if you're in a part of the country that has a lot of hills, part of the world that has a lot of hills or mountains in your 300K, like the 400K coming up that I have, you're just, it's very, you have to be really fast. And there are people that still do it, but you know, it's just, it's just harder. So R70 is 70% and R80 is 80% of total time. So when people say, well, brevets aren't races, you know what? They are not. However, we all want to challenge ourselves. We all are trying to ride, in most cases, faster than ourselves from the previous year, right? So I want to get a PR from my previous event. I worked on a couple of things from last year. This is just an example. So this year I hope to do better than the previous year. So that's the sense of urgency to get these events done. The other thing was, in this particular case, I just wanted to get home. There was just no reason to be out there. You know, parts of that course are not areas that I want to stop and hang out and sightsee or sit down for a meal. Just get home. I've got plenty of food at home that I I made it Irish coddle you know sausage potato stew you know Guinness uh, beer at the beginning and do all that other stuff it was just it was waiting for me at home so I wanted that um, all right so also the 12 hour goal was because I've done double centuries with about 10,000 feet around 12 hours or a little less so a 200 miler with support, you know, um, at 25 to 30 miles on the course, every 25 to 35 miles. So I figured 188 unsupported should equate to 200 supported, you know, about 12, 15 miles difference should be about the same time frame. That's kind of the way I figured that out. Did the stop at 83, the stop at 200K, 125, and then we stopped also along the park called Doheny State Park, which is San Clemente. And then again in Carlsbad, <laughs> Brooke uh, got water from a shower head, <laughs> um, you know, because it's right on the beach. So, you know, when you come out of the beach um, surf, you, you rinse off. Now, I love the guy. He's a great guy and he's super strong. But I wonder why he rides the short bottles, because I was riding, you know, just a regular st standard 
you know, 26 inch, uh, 26 ounce bottles. And <clears throat> from Huntington Beach to the finish was 64 miles. I didn't need to stop again to, to top off my bottles. So, you know, he's writing the short bottles, uh, which are usually like 22 ounce. So if you had two of these, that's eight extra ounces, you know, so I don't know. But that's, I mean, he's a very experienced ultra cyclist, so he knows what to use. Um, okay, let's talk about recovery. I gained about seven pounds in recovery. And this is due to the fact that I only had four bottles of fluids the entire day, right? And that's common for me to not drink that much uh, when I do these, when I do long rides. But then after the fact, I'm drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking. So that's a little over three kilograms for those. Uh, Sunday, Jess had already signed us up for a... Um, a track class try the track and honestly if she hadn't signed us up and paid for it I would have slept in and stayed in but we went down and I actually had a good time and it was way better for my recovery to actually be moving and there is a track video coming Monday we did another ride but I had no energy I mean I just could not stay with her and those of you who ride with a power meter my TSS for that um, 300K was 766. So that's a pretty high number. That's, you know, at least three days of recovery. And for those that don't know what TSS, it's training stress score. Essentially, if you did a 100 training stress score during a one-hour ride, that meant you basically rode at your FTP, your functional threshold power, for one hour. 766 for 11 hours, uh, 1044 of pedal time. It's a pretty high TSS for someone who is just an average Joe. Me and you are the same, right? I lost two sets of readers. The first pair I lost, and then later in the event, I had another, I had another spare pair of readers in, in my bag. And so I was able to collect those from Jess. Hey, I, I can't, you know, because there's some things I just can't read. And especially at night, uh, reading the, the display screen is, is just hard. And I didn't want to turn up the brightness because I was trying to conserve battery because you never know what's going to happen. You may go out there and say, oh, I'm going to finish this one in 10 hours because there's no climbing. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> you, you cut a tire or your friend cuts a tire and, and, and someone breaks a, a derailleur cable, you know. All kinds of things can happen, not to mention you can crash or something. And so you're out there for all of the 20 hours to finish it. As a matter of fact, um, three of the seven people that were on this event or six that were on this event, I mean, they came in at 18 hours, 54 minutes. So they were riding uh, one and a half hours in the morning in the dark and then sunset was around seven and they finished at midnight. So another five hours at night. So you want to conserve battery life where you can, right? Because they, their computers, their headlights, everything had to operate for about an hour and a half in the morning time frame and about five hours in the evening time frame, plus the entire day, right? If, if we're just talking the cycling computer. I appreciate if you stuck around this long. I, I am long-winded, but you knew that before you saw the time um, the time on the video. So thank you so much if you've stuck all the way through to the end. And if you have, please, I want to see the thumbs up icon in the comment section. But more importantly, I want to hear from you folks. Did you learn something? Did you pick up something that you could use? What is, what is the one thing that you picked up from this discussion that you will apply on your next Brevet Century or long distance event, whatever that is for you, whether it be a 50 miler, because you've never done 50 miles and you're working towards that. What is the one thing you learned that you wish to apply? And then make a comment down below. Okay, thank you so much for tuning in. Please like and subscribe. We'll see you up the road.